for this a major policy addressing carbon pollution state by state in the U.S. Many in our audience are likely familiar with this policy but seek greater clarity regarding the role of renewables, especially bioenergy, in the state-level plans being designed as we speak. The goal of this webinar series is to take stock of what we know, what opportunities this policy opens nationally and locally, what information from recent literature should enter this topic of conversation, how we can conduct fair and balanced advocacy on behalf of the industry in which we study and work, and what uncertainties stakeholders in the bioeconomy face when engaging on this topic. At this point, I want to make a note about a recently announced open EPA workshop for stakeholders at the intersection of CPP state implementation plans and biomass. This is a free workshop to be that can be attended in person in DC or remotely via webinar. This workshop will be an excellent opportunity to receive input and clarification directly from the EPA on the complex issues we're all navigating on this subject. Registration information can be found via the link in the chat pod to the left or in the notes for the recording. So today's presentation, to which I'm pleased to welcome you all, is the second in our new webinar series. Our first presentation, an overview of the context for American carbon policy and biomass in the clean power plan, is available as a recording on the series webpage for schedule detailing future URL can be found linked in the chat pod to the left or in the notes for the recording. Our next presentation extends a topic we begin today, carbon accounting in the bioenergy, in bioenergy systems, with speaker Emily McGlynn, Senior Advisor at Forest Trends, on February 23rd at 1 p.m. Eastern. Again, all webinar sessions will be recorded and released on YouTube to allow later viewing and sharing via the series webpage. During today's presentation, feel free to type your questions in the chat pod, and we'll address qu qu quick points of clarification immediately and set aside some time at the end to go through more complex topics with our speaker. The presentation today, entitled Counting Carbon in Bioenergy Systems, presented by Dr. Peter Woodbury of Cornell University. Dr. Woodbury designs ways to improve the sustainability of agricultural and forest ecosystems and to improve agricultural and environmental management and policy. He has expertise in how air quality, water quality, and soil quality will be affected by climate change, as well as how agriculture and forestry can become more resilient to climate change. His research has addressed how bioenergy, forest carbon sequestration, and agricultural practices can mitigate climate change by reducing greenhouse gas emissions. He has contributed to U.S. national carbon accounting reporting required under the United Nations Framework Convention for Climate Change and has provided expertise to federal and state governments on mitigation and adaptation opportunities in agriculture and forestry, including methods to account for these benefits. Peter brings this subject expertise to our topic of bioenergy carbon accounting in this session, and we're very lucky to have him with us today. Thank you. And uh, I have a bit of a cough today. I'll try to um, mute my speaker if I need to cough and apologize in advance for that. OK, how did we get here and where are we going? Um, in, in brief, a few years ago, EPA found that greenhouse gases threaten public health and welfare. And that's kind of the basis then for federal uh, activities to try to mitigate climate change. Focusing on the, on the, in this series, we're focusing on the Clean Power Plan, although today I'm going to be talking a little bit more generally about carbon and greenhouse gas accounting. I'm going to have quite a few slides today with text on them, and I won't try to read all the text. I encourage you, if you're interested in more in how do we get here and where we're going in relation to the Clean Power Plan to check out the previous presentation and as well as subsequent presentations in this series. OK, so here's just a few things I've heard around the water cooler in the past few years. You know, I think it's just worth thinking about what people want from a carbon accounting system. <clears throat> 
And you may very well have your own ideas, too. So if I was a regulated party, uh, I think I would want an accounting system that was very predictable. And I'd want it to be simple to implement. Uh, a regulated party to implement. I'm thinking regulators would want a system that will support the policy goals and something that's hopefully manageable. Uh, the not litigated is a little bit of a joke for those of you who follow these kind of things because so many things end up getting litigated one way or another. So you'll hear from uh, from me kind of the scientific uh, so my what I want from a from a system I'm, I'm speaking as a scientist throughout this talk really so I'm interested in a system that's accurate and and comprehensive so making sure we actually get the correct answer and what might the public want well they might want any or all of the above so I encourage you if you have other ideas about what you want or others might want, feel free to type them in the, in the chat pod. Uh, you might also ponder, uh, could any method provide all of the above goals? Here are just a uh, accounting for biogenic carbon dioxide emissions. We could treat them just the same as fossil fuel carbon dioxide. Uh, in other words, not give any, any credit for bioenergy. I think that would be problematic because bioenergy systems can certainly provide uh, lower greenhouse gas emissions than, than fossil fuel systems. So we'd like to have some way, I think, to account for that. treating bio, biogenic carbon dioxide as carbon neutral. In other words, if it's carbon dioxide from bio, no addition to the atmosphere. Well, that certainly fulfills the goal of being simple. But I think by the end of the talk, you may agree with me that that may not really capture the complexity of bioenergy systems. So then we can start thinking about something in between these two things, where bioenergy or biogenic emissions would get a credit, but maybe not be treated. Ways we could calculate this kind of a ratio. Uh, life cycle, and that could be uh, used to try to calculate this ratio. There are lots of different kinds of, of biomass. I'm not going to, again, read this whole slide, but just to think about the distinction between material that's uh, a residue of some other product. So maybe branches and tops of trees that are harvested for high value wood products. There's also emissions from landfills. So landfills emit as well as carbon dioxide. And those emissions may be occurring, and there might be an opportunity to actually use that methane to produce energy. To improve our ability to grow uh, switchgrass or other grasses and shrub willow as kind of a purpose-grown crop for a bioenergy feedstock. So along with these many kinds of biomass, there's all kinds of different biogenic CO2 emissions. So there's decomposition in landfills, manure management, and this goes beyond just CO2 emissions, but also thinking about methane. You may or may not be thinking about is combustion tires, then that's a form of biomass. 
or combustion of municipal solid waste, which is also largely is, is a form of, of biomass. So here are some kind of themes that we're going to we're going to come back to through the rest of the presentation. So the scope of the analysis, what's what do we count and what don't we count? The choice of the baseline, what are we comparing our bioenergy system to? And the spatial scale going from perhaps a single facility or a single re small region up to a national scale. And then time scales from annual to centuries. So I'm going to talk about two examples here to start to dig into some of these issues of scope and, and baseline and, and time scales. Here's a picture of a, of a forest. And when I've been doing carbon accounting, this is kind of what I see when I look at a forest, not just the live trees, but also thinking about soil in the forest floor. So that would be leaves and branches at some stage of decomposition, down dead wood, standing dead trees, and then carbon in the soil as well. So I have a question at the top of this slide, what's missing? And I'll let you think about that. And uh, the clue here is the, f the word sector up above. And we'll come back to this in a minute. So thinking about the baseline, what might be happening already? Well, one thing that's happening already is that forests are sequestering carbon. So they're removing it from the atmosphere and storing it in some of those pools that we just looked at. So this is... carbon in forests throughout the United States. And I need to point out there's always a challenge with carbon accounting. The negative values here refer to removing carbon from the atmosphere. So a red color means the forests are actually growing and there's more and more carbon in the forest, which means carbon is being removed from the atmosphere. The blue colors mean that forests are being harvested faster than they're growing. So there's less carbon in the forest over time. Okay. So now we're going to talk about counting carbon in terms of stocks, meaning also sometimes called pools. So these are the amount of carbon that's in the trees. So this green section shows how much carbon is in U.S. forests. Notice here is there's actually more carbon in the soils than there is in the, in the trees themselves. And there's some carbon in the forest floor and very little carbon in land-filled wood or wood products. But if we look at the change in carbon, meaning, say, from one year to the next, what's the change in the carbon? That's this next, next bar here. So trees are, are even more important. So that's about half of the change in, in forest carbon. But look at this. Now landfills and wood products are a very large portion of the total change in carbon. So this is the these were the missing pieces uh, from the earlier picture when we were so we were just looking at the forest and we saw the trees but we weren't seeing the wood that goes into landfills and wood products. So forest management also affects carbon dioxide emissions from forests. And this is a little bit complicated. I hope I can explain it here. 
So at, on the bottom axis, we have stand age going from 0 to 100 years. And on the, on the vertical axis, sorry, I'm just trying to find the pointer. On the vertical axis, we have the total carbon. So in this diagram, we're harvesting this forest every 25 years. So forest carbon in, in trees is this green, and it increases for 25 years. Then we harvest those trees, and it goes back to zero. And all of that wood that's harvested goes in this diagram into four categories. The top one is the emissions, which is carbon lost to the atmosphere. The yellow, so this could be using wood, harvested wood, combusted to produce electricity, for example. Some of that wood is going into landfills and being sequestered or stored there. And some goes into wood products. And as we repeat this over four growing cycles, over 100 years, these are the total amounts of carbon going into each of these categories. OK, so now I wanted to make the diagram even more complicated. The, the bottom half of this diagram is, is just what we looked at in the previous slide. All I've done here is to summarize to say this is the carbon loss to the atmosphere, and this is carbon gain, either increased carbon storage or energy used in place of fossil fuel. The top panel is a naturally regenerated forest. So in this example, we're saying this is a lower intensity management, and we're only harvesting every 50 years. And then we have the same categories of use of that harvested wood. The point I want to make here is when we harvest more often, we actually end up with a greater total energy produced and a greater total carbon sequestered than we do under a lower management regime. And this is important because it's a little different than how many people think about in, in a forest bioenergy system. A lot of people think that if we harvest a forest more often, then we're removing the opportunity for carbon sequestration. But that's not necessarily the case. All right, so here's a summary of where we've gotten so far. Under this topic of kind of the scope of the analysis, here are some questions to ask about our accounting system. Are we going to count carbon sequestration in trees? What about down deadwood in the forest or landfills or two by fours and floorboards in a house? And are we going to think about how that biomass is produced, how it's managed? So I see a, a question here in the chat box. Why did the intensively managed and naturally regenerated forest not begin with the same trajectory? That's because the intensively managed one, we're assuming we're planting fast growing trees and we're managing them so that they will grow quickly. So it's a, it's a very different management system. <clears throat> a, a published study called the Manomet study, which got a lot of attention, claimed that producing electricity from woody biomass instead of coal 
will actually increase greenhouse gas emissions for several decades. So this certainly got people's attention because it was a surprising result. All right, so let's look at what this study came up with. Again, on the bottom axis, we have time going from zero years up to 100 years. And on the vertical axis, we have a change in carbon dioxide. And this is, again, you have to watch out with carbon accounting because what's positive or negative depends on who's doing the presentation. In this case, negative values mean carbon emission to the atmosphere, and positive values mean carbon storage. So this study compared burning coal in a power plant to harvesting wood and burning that to produce electricity line with the squares is represents burning coal to produce electricity. So there is emission of CO2 to the atmosphere at time zero when you burn the coal. And that's the end of the activity. So that doesn't change over time just for that coal burning. The biomass, on the other hand, this study found there was even more emission of CO2 at the time zero than there was for coal. But over many decades, you finally got back to breaking even with coal. And then after that, there's a carbon benefit of the bioenergy compared to coal. So let's see how they, how they got this result. Uh, let me just point out, <clears throat> at time zero, this is what's referred to as a carbon debt. The, uh, the concept being this study found greater emission from bioenergy, creating this so-called carbon debt. And you could gradually pay off the benefit. Okay, so why did they find a carbon debt in this study? And this is, when you look closely at the study, you find that they assumed a combustion efficiency of 25% for biomass, They assumed also that in both cases, you're just burning coal or biomass to produce electricity, and you're not making any use of the excess heat. They assumed using whole trees or stems of trees rather than the, the tops and limbs or the residue. Are these assumptions reasonable? Well, my answer is Actually, I said maybe, but I think yes, for a large coal plant and a small biomass plant, you'd expect this kind of difference in efficiency. If you had different assumptions about the size or the efficiency of the plants, then different efficiency values would be appropriate. As, an, as one example, a biomass heat and power system could have a much higher efficiency when you count both the heat and the power. And then this assumption of using whole trees rather than residues, I think it's much more likely that you would use just the residues. You'd harvest the, the stems of the trees for high value wood products and harvest the branches and tops for bioenergy. So here's another topic related to spatial scale. 
could harvesting increase forest carbon sequestration? And I think it's possible for a couple of First, it could increase the rate of carbon sequestration. So this goes back to the example I showed previously of a of a intensively managed stand could have faster growth rates or carbon sequestration rates than a, a low intensity management for a stand. Another interesting wrinkle is higher prices for wood products and potentially for bioenergy, biomass, could actually induce people to plant forests. And here's a quote from one study. Now this might occur in areas with plantations. This wouldn't be relevant for areas like the Northeast US where there are very few plantations. So here are my conclusions about the Manomet study. They focused on an, a somewhat unlikely scenario. So if you just focused on harvesting branches and tops, you'd have a very different result. So here's again some, some summary about this example for these topics we discussed earlier. So it makes a big difference if we're focusing just on electricity or if we're counting a, if there's a possibility to have a benefit from both heat and power. So again, it depends what kind of conversion your system you have. And this is related again to this idea of efficiency. Baseline, it makes a big difference to the calculation whether you're using whole trees, which if you left them in the forest, they would keep growing and sequestering carbon, or whether you're using tops and limbs, which would be decomposing in the forest within a, a, a few decades and emitting that CO2 if they weren't used for bioenergy. I'm going to jump down to the time scale here and, and just point out again that the answer changed in this example depending on whether you looked right after combustion at time zero or if you looked a few decades later or, or many decades later. So far, we've just been talking about, and I made a brief mention of methane. But both methane and nitrous oxide are really important because small amount, they're, they're much more potent greenhouse gases than CO2. So small amounts of them make a big difference if you're accounting for greenhouse gases. So this will be familiar to, to many of you. But a global warming potential is just a way to try to say, what is the impact on the climate of methane or another greenhouse gas compared to carbon dioxide? So for example, methane over 20 years is about 86 times as potent a greenhouse gas as carbon dioxide. Methane over 100 years is only 34 times as potent as carbon dioxide. And that's because it has a shorter half-life or a shorter residence time. It is much higher, nearly 300. So I'm going to just talk about an example of 
accounting for greenhouse gas emissions just from the production of a number of different biomass feedstocks in New York State from some work we did a few years ago. So here are a, a bunch of different biomass feedstocks, starting with corn or maize, and moving across to hardwood and softwood harvested from naturally regenerated forests. And the thing I want to point out here is there's many different sources of greenhouse gas emissions in the production in producing biomass, but most of the emissions are related to nitrogen. So either nitrous oxide emissions directly or the production of the fertilizer. The other some feedstocks like maize or corn have much higher greenhouse gas emissions than other feedstocks. For the grass and willow that are, are grown specifically as a bioenergy feedstock, the emissions are much lower than for corn. But again, a large fraction of those greenhouse gas emissions for those feedstocks are related to nitrogen. So if we're only counting carbon, we're going to get the wrong answer if we're interested in total greenhouse gas emissions. And this slide is, is a little messy. It's showing nitrous oxide emissions just from corn fields. And these are measurements made in many fields. So each dot repre represents one corn field in one growing season. On the bottom axis is nitrogen fertilizer addition, and then nitrous oxide emission on the vertical axis. So we see at any given fertilizer addition of nitrous oxide emissions from nearly zero to, to quite high. And we can fit various lines to try to represent this, but the point is greenhouse gas emissions, even for a single feedstock, such as corn. This slide shows emissions if we count with or without land use change. Or another way to say that is with or without soil carbon storage. So in our analysis, it made a huge difference for, for growing grasses as a bioenergy feedstock. You'd get net emissions for producing the feedstock if you didn't count soil carbon sequestration. But when you plant grasses on land that formerly had an annual crop, they have a much bigger root system if you plant perennial grasses such as switchgrass. So they'll actually store enough carbon in the soil for several decades that it actually reverses the sign of the I should note for the willow fans, the same thing could happen with willow. In our example, more of the grasses were planted on annual cropland than, than willow. But if you plant willow on annual cropland, you could get the same result we show here for the grasses. So this graph is just showing the yield of something like of, of switchgrass, for example, and showing that greenhouse gas emissions decrease as the yield of grass increases. So this is actually can be a win-win situation if we're wanting to increase yields to improve the, the profitability of the system. There may be an opportunity to do that and also decrease greenhouse gas emissions from the production of the biomass. <clears throat> 
Okay, so here's a summary of this example that we just talked about of bioenergy feedstock. So one thing we found is if we most of the most of the emissions from feedstock production were from nitrous oxide or upstream emissions from producing the fertilizer and lime. So if we leave out if we only count the carbon we are going to miss a lot of the greenhouse gas emissions. We also found that including soil carbon sequestration can totally change the result. We saw a lot of variation among locations. Some of that's due to soils and some is due to management. And we saw a lot of variation in greenhouse gas emissions among different feedstocks. As far as time scales, if we do include soil carbon sequestration or forest carbon sequestration, it only occurs for a certain amount of time and eventually a new equilibrium will be reached and there won't be any further sequestration. I'm just going to have one slide here talking about the cost of, of sampling carbon. So on the bottom axis is sampling effort. So this is a number of different plots that get measured. And every plot you measure is going to increase the cost as you increase the number of plots. And the vertical axis is the accuracy of counting how much carbon is in a particular forest. So just focusing on this top line is a 13 hectare small watershed. And if we wanted to get accuracy of within 10% of the mean, we would need something like 80 plots. And that would be quite expensive to measure it. And if you want to have to go back and remeasure it sometime later and calculate the difference between the two. However, at, at national, state, and county scales, there are already data being collected that we can use to analyze forest carbon sequestration. So this is the same map we looked at earlier. And then since the data are already available, the costs can be relatively low. So just a quick summary on this topic of, of cost of counting carbon. Thinking about spatial scales, What's the size of the bioenergy fuel shed? So if we're thinking about a specific facility, where is from? Do we want to really account for what's happening specifically for that facility? Or would it be good enough if we can count what's happening in the entire county or state? Because the, if we really want to measure at a local scale, it's going to be expensive. As far as time scales, if we have an accounting system that says you have to report every year, that would be very expensive to measure. And even if we can use existing databases, there may not be data every look in every location in every year. Okay, so I have we, we I have three summary slides here, and then look forward to getting to some of your questions and your thoughts. So, in terms of the scope of the analysis, 
carbon storage, whether it's in trees in a forest or two by fours in a house, really affects the total greenhouse gas accounting. In other words, it affects the answer you come up with, if you include that or not. We also saw some examples of how biomass management really affects greenhouse gas emissions. So both for purpose-grown crops as well as forests. If nitrogen fertilizers used, then nitrous oxide and related emissions are going to dominate the total greenhouse gas emissions. So if we leave those out, we're not going to get a complete picture of the total greenhouse gas balance. There's a big difference residues, biomass that, that is a residue of some other process versus growing a forest plantation or a short rotation willow field or a switchgrass field specifically as a bioenergy feedstock. We also saw that efficiency in producing the energy really matters. So it's not just a question of using biomass versus a fossil fuel, but whether we're using them to produce energy with the same efficiency or not. We also saw, or at least I, I, I hope we, we, we talked a little bit about the alternate fate of the biomass really matters. So forest trees that would continue to grow and sequester carbon car impact on the greenhouse gas balance than tops and branches which would have been decomposing in the forest. In some regions of the country, some of those residues might even be burned. So you'd release that carbon dioxide very rapidly. In terms of spatial scales, we saw really large differences in emissions among locations. And we saw big differences among different kinds of feedstocks. We saw that if we want to get an accurate measurement of carbon changes at a local scale, it could be very expensive. But at larger scales, if we can, we can use existing national databases and it can be much less expensive. Examples of how time scales matter. A simple example is that global warming potentials are different in some cases such as methane, between 20 and 100 years. We saw that if soil carbon sequestration is included, it makes a huge difference, but only for a certain number of decades until we reach a new equilibrium. And we also saw examples of how the results can differ depending on the time scale. So in summary, I'm not going to try to tell you what the best accounting system would look like. But I wanted to highlight some, what do I think are some of the best opportunities for bioenergy to contribute to reducing greenhouse So one opportunity is when there when there would be greenhouse gas emissions from the alternate fate of the biomass, when those emissions would be large, such as methane emissions from a landfill. Another opportunity is if we can increase the efficiency of energy production, or at least make sure for the bioenergy system that the efficiency is just as high as the fossil fuel system. There'll be greater opportunities when methane and nitrous oxide emissions are low from a bioenergy system because they're such potent greenhouse gases. There'll be a lot of more of an opportunity 
when there are other greenhouse gas benefits besides simply replacing fossil fuel emissions. So this could be carbon sequestration in soil or forest. And my parting thought is even if we're thinking about emissions from a point source such as a power plant, we really need to think about the whole system if we want to get the right answer. So this is where um, I'm falling in the scientist camp and saying, I think we need to really have a life cycle kind of approach if we want to understand what the total greenhouse gas balance would be. I have a few references here, and I can, I'm happy to point to you to other ones. And I want to acknowledge the New Bio Project and some other current funding sources as well as prior support. Thanks very much. We have some time. Okay, thank you. A lot of the questions that were submitted to deal with this issue of the complexity of accounting, the differences between regional uh, bases for this, the, the establishment of baselines and scope. There's an interesting development last week um, so last week, an amendment was offered to the Energy Policy Modernization Act that would attempt to treat all forest-based biomass as essentially carbon neutral. Um, so you had, in your first couple of slides, presented a few major classes of approaching the question of carbon accounting. And at those two extremes of simplification, we're treating biogenic carbon the same as fossil carbon and treating it as carbon neutral. So this amendment, which is uh, referred to as the Collins Amendment since it was submitted by Senator Susan Collins of Maine, would treat that essentially as carbon neutral. As we talk about the Clean Power Plan and the need for state implementation plans to deal with the question of carbon accounting, certainly that would cut through some of the complexity here that we're talking about. But I, I'm sort of looking um, it certainly cuts through the complexity and makes it more operationally simple. But is there something really essential that's lost in an approach like that? Great, thank you. Um, I'll try to provide a short answer, and we could go back and forth on this a little bit further as, as well if people are interested. So I think, you know, we've just looked at several examples where there are several factors that really affect how forest biomass, you know, what are the greenhouse gas emissions from a forest bioenergy system? So, you know, I, I appreciate simplicity as well, um, but I think that assuming carbon neutrality um, is clearly going to miss many factors that have a huge influence on the greenhouse gas emissions. So it passes the test for simplicity, but I think it would be uh, difficult to argue really the, the right answer that could be applied for all bioenergy systems over all time. Um, does take energy to harvest wood from the forest, and it takes energy to transport it. Um, when you want to compare a fossil system to a bioenergy system, you want to include the, the same things. Uh, but I think simply assuming uh, carbon neutrality would not give credit where, for, for bioenergy systems that have greater benefits versus bioenergy systems that have very small benefits. Yeah, certainly a good point. Um, it, you know, it does get back to the issue that when you're dealing with a national scale question with so much variability in the feedstock, uh, it's much harder to approach those questions with, with a kind of accuracy. And I think it's natural to reach for some of these oversimplifications, but 
Um, but I agree with you that there is definitely something that's critical lost in there. I want to, if I can, go back to versus naturally regenerated forest questions. There were a lot of questions. Sure, but Sarah, let me let me just jump in and say, you know, without going as far as saying all forest biomass should be considered carbon neutral, there could be some opportunities to identify narrower groups of feedstocks that might be considered carbon neutral. So, you know, if we said if we said that capturing methane emissions from a landfill and using that for bioenergy, you know, in, it's hard for me to imagine a situation where that would not provide a very large benefit. Um, in fact, methane, as we saw, has a much higher greenhouse gas uh, impact than CO2. So if you capture methane that's already being emitted from a landfill and you convert that into energy and burn it and produce CO2 instead, you're getting a huge benefit. So I think there may be some specific situations that could be identified where we say, hey, this is just going to be a huge benefit. We don't need to do a site-specific or a complex example that is not quite as extreme, but forest residue materials that, so we talked about the tops and branches that are already being produced when high value timber is being harvested. You know, we might be able to look at those and say, that's a material that has a very low greenhouse gas emission when you use it for bioenergy because Otherwise, it would be decomposing in, in the forest. So do you think that that's something, those types of examples are appropriate to approach at these sort of broad level regional strokes and forest types? So here's one example. I mean, you talked about um, tops and branches as residues, but consider northeastern forests where there's an abundant of low use, low market value wood. Um, which even as whole trees would fit nicely into this model and certainly need a market uh, like this in order to incentivize better civil culture in that region. Um, at Penn State, so this is uh, certainly significant to me and I imagine other forest types have these sort of specific examples too of a perhaps quote non-traditional residue that still requires a market like this. So at these broad regional strokes, I mean, would something like that be an example of a sort of automatically approved feedstock that you might suggest? Well, that's a good example. And, you know, I'm in the Northeast as well, so I'm very sympathetic to this idea and I'm in favor of improved forest management. We have to make sure we're distinguishing between overall social goals and greenhouse gas accounting. So there might be a great benefit to removing non-commercial and low-value material from forests as part of a, you know, part of a good forest management strategy. That might provide great benefits for, you know, improved harvest of wood products in the future, improved wildlife. Careful to say. You know, I'm sure that's what we're counting. Certainly. Uh, in the broader civil cultural argument, though, I mean, a lot of those um, resid uh, those lower use materials, you know, if left alone um, in a high grade situation or something like that, might influence future regeneration and the pace of carbon capture in a regenerating stand? I'm sorry, I was trying to glance at the the chat box okay. and I yeah. kind of missed your summary there. <laughs> sure, um, you know, maybe I should go beyond this uh, this example since we're, we're dealing with a national audience too. I, I might suggest, you know, another 
another option of a specific feedstock that could be sort of pre-approved would be something like uh, what's being discussed with um, uh, fire mitigation potential in the Rocky Mountain West, especially where there's pine beetle killed trees. Um, would that be something that you might, uh, would that be a good example of sort of what you're talking about? In category of, you know, we might have some forest management goals and they might include, you know, reducing the danger of catastrophic fire in a forest stand. So that might be a highly worthwhile thing to do to get some of that fire prone material out of that stand and use it for some useful purpose. Uh, this gets to an important aspect of accounting that I, I didn't really highlight, but it relates to what I talked about in terms of scope and baseline. So if, you know, what I showed, I didn't point it out, but I showed that in greenhouse gas emissions from producing corn were very high. Uh, on that same graph, I showed that emissions from corn stover, which is just the above ground part of the corn plant besides the grain, were very low. And that's an accounting decision, right? It all came from the same. And that we got that answer because we attributed the greenhouse gas emissions to the grain production. So the residue, we our accounting was there were relatively low emissions associated with that residue. So that would be a material that would be more beneficial as a bioenergy feedstock. But that's because of the way we did the accounting, where we said the the management was all attributed to the corn grain. So in the forest example, we have the same issue. So if you said your baseline was you're going to go in in the western U.S. in a fire-prone beetle-killed stand and you're going to remove dead wood to remove fire danger, and your option is either to leave it there or either burn it to get rid of it or leave it to decompose, or use that material for bioenergy, you'll get a different answer than if you said, OK, we have to account for all the trucks going in there, the energy required to do the activity. I hope this is making sense. Um, you know, So this is a really important issue about baselines and what you're comparing your bioenergy system to. And this is the reason why residues of some other activity can often look very favorable from a greenhouse gas perspective because you're attributing a lot of the emissions to the primary product. Right, right. So state regulators building state implementation plans, if they're going to involve biomass in their, in their plans, um, that they will submit to the EPA in September, we'll have to deal with this in some way. Um, would you recommend an approach that would that would focus on using some of the key data sources that you mentioned that are more at more of a regional scale? Uh, are there good examples of this scale of resource that those people would reach out to? Okay, so this is where I have to be careful about, um, well, I, I, I want to be careful not, I don't, I don't want to make a specific recommendation of how a state should uh, perform its accounting <clears throat> for the Clean Power Plan. You know, about as close as I wanted to get to that was trying to summarize some of the big issues as I see them and point to some of the larger opportunities. Sure. If I, I think you know, know we may be. My question to yeah, ask go ahead. If, what I'm what I'm getting at is maybe not a specific recommendation from you, but um, you know, you mentioned the importance of this sort of key scale to focus on as these plans are built, and certainly that to a point crosses state lines in in a regional uh, type argument. So you know, is would you recommend a sort of focus on that type of scale with the data sources that serve that scale? as a useful approach for something like this policy? 
Okay, so you're you're trying to push me to make a. Sp um, I want to highlight the trade-off. So, if you want to look, if your goal, let's say you're a member of the public and you're skeptical, you're somebody who's skeptical about the the greenhouse gas benefits of bioenergy. So you want to see a bioenergy system in Western Massachusetts. If they're harvesting wood from forests, you really want to be shown that there's going to be a, a net greenhouse gas benefit for that specific facility. You might not be happy if somebody said, well, this facility might have a poor greenhouse gas emission benefit, but nationally, everything looks good, right? So this gets to the question of what's the purpose of the accounting system? You know, at what scale do you want to assure that there are greenhouse gas benefits? Um, and again, what I wanted to just point out is that trade-off, if you will, for, for say, a facility scale operation, uh, the cost and logistics of that would be very high. Um, whereas a county to state to national scale system looking at forest biomass, you might be able to come up with a much lower cost system, but you wouldn't be able to attribute the benefits to specific facilities or operations. In fact, it might be hard to know uh, uh, if forests are sequestering carbon or if forests are being over harvested, it might be hard to know whether how much of that to attribute to bioenergy versus other causes of forest harvest. So let's talk about you know a specific part of the, the spectrum and the, the scale of, of accounting that we're talking about. Um, a couple of questions have come in about efficiency side of things. Um, so Jesse asks about the efficiency rate for co-firing of biomass. Certainly that's a metric that would be important to consider in an accounting scheme that would use that type of, um, of bioenergy. So does the efficiency reach that of coal? Right. So I'm not an expert on you know, converting, you know, on the efficiency of various systems for converting biomass into electricity. But from my understanding of the literature, a small biomass plant, a 25% efficiency is a reasonable assumption compared to a larger coal plant at 32%. You could have an even smaller system that produces heat and power designed to meet you know, a heating load for, for say, a, a university. Uh, and that could have a, a much higher overall efficiency because you're getting a benefit from, from the heat. The point I'm trying to make is many no attention whatsoever, right? They're just trying to focus on the biomass. Would you recommend a, a fuller accounting of sort of cradle to grave in that case? Well, again, I'm you know I'm hesitant to a recommendation. I would want to see a, understand a specific context and set of goals for that. But what I would say is, if our goal is to use bioenergy resources in a, a feasible and cost-effective manner to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. If we ignore efficiency, then we're going to really miss a lot of opportunities, right? Because we wouldn't, we wouldn't care. If we just said we want to use as much biomass as possible to produce energy, but we don't care if it's 10% efficiency of conversion or 90%, then we're not incentivizing higher efficiencies. Yeah, and, and several of our participants have, have uh, 
put comments in the chat pod expressing the importance of design of those facilities too, which is maybe outside of the question of the, the management of the resource, but still certainly very important for um, you know fitting a, a proper scale um, in a CHP plan or something like that. I want to ask another question that that Carl had suggested. Uh, you know, he he cites a specific study asking uh, asking about issues of land use change. My question to you is: as we talk about the U.S. specifically, um, with the incentivization of bioenergy systems and uh, renewable sources of carbon being used for power specifically, or heat and power, or you know various other fuels platforms, do you, do you have concerns about land use change that could result in uh, net carbon emission uh, on a national scale associated with And let me just slightly change the question to, you know, do I think that land use change needs to be considered in a, in a greenhouse gas accounting scheme? And my answer to that question is definitely yes. Um, an advantage of a scheme applied at a national scale as opposed to a facility scale is the issues of, so, so the jargon is leakage. Um, and let me back up just a moment. Probably most people are familiar with this, but the idea is, you know, if you're getting some kind of credit from an accounting scheme, you want to make sure you're not just shifting the activity somewhere else. So if you're getting some credit for a bioenergy system that both sequesters carbon in the forest and uses forest residues to produce energy, um, you want to make sure you're not just shifting some kind of harvest activity and you're losing a lot of forests somewhere else, which is causing a lot of greenhouse gas emissions. So, so again, the scale uh, affects that. At the national scale, then you're getting a bit more of a wash about what happens among forests in the US. Um, there could still be a kind of a leakage from one country to another. Um, so I don't know if I'm really answering your question. Sure. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I mean, certainly you underscored the importance of it. How, how is the, how is that, how do we approach that predictively? Yeah, so let me give another example. Um, if we took all of the corn land in the country and we planted switchgrass or willow on it, we'd probably want some corn from somewhere else since we I don't, I don't really like eating switchgrass and willow myself. Um, so if all of that corn production shifted to another country, we're just moving those. So, so that's kind of an extreme example. Um, you know, how do we account for this? That can get very messy because this is fundamentally getting into an economic realm. Um, uh, you know, to what extent would corn be substituted for some other crop that's grown in the U.S., et cetera. So um, this question of, of leakage, I think, can be very difficult to estimate and, and quantify in, an, in any accounting system. So sort of shifting the focus back to the opportunities let's i would recommend trying to identify bioenergy opportunities where there's very little potential for this kind of leakage and some examples so again if we focus on residues from other activities because they are residues and the primary economic activity is something else, we're less likely to be driving a land use change, right? So if we say we're going to harvest all the forests to produce bioenergy, um, just clear cut everything, that could be a pretty drastic land use change. 
if we say we're going to harvest only material that's already dead, you know, fire prone, etc., as we discussed earlier, as a byproduct of some other activity, there's much less, very low likelihood that we're creating land use change by using those residue materials. Great. I I've had a couple requests to return to this um, the figure that compared intensively and naturally regenerated forests. Could we re revisit that quickly? Um, so the since we um, so it looks like since the rotation length is is quite small, I'm guessing this is a plantation type scenario. Yes. The important point I wanted to make here is just that a higher intensity production system and a more frequent harvest of the forest doesn't necessarily mean a lower greenhouse gas benefit. It could be just this example shows just the opposite. And that's really, that was really the purpose of, sh of this example. I see. So maybe, you know, this is a good example of a, a regionally relevant example. Um, and other forest types would would have to, you know, have their own more locally based studies to demonstrate. Right. Again, this was just intended to say, uh, if your starting point is thinking, you know, that there'll be greater greenhouse gas benefits by leaving by harvesting forests less often, that's not necessarily the case. Right. Sorry for the choppy questions here. Um, we've received so many uh, inquiries and so many comments, it's hard to keep up with our, our audience's concerns. I think uh, if I'm going to summarize sort of what the general feelings of the audience have been, I think some of the key things that a lot of the comments have landed on is uh, the importance of designing suitably scaled bioenergy systems um, that deal very well with this question of usage efficiencies. Uh, second is the issue of uh, the avoided or alternative use. So is how long does it take for the tree to die and decompose eventually anyway, even if we don't use it? Uh, how quickly is it going to be used once? Boundaries, I think Peter has uh, emphasized again and again, that are, are very, very important. Um, and I think another key has been the, the difference between different forest types, um, how you know different sustainability concerns uh, act in those systems, different multiple use management objectives, which is always a, a goal of forestry and agricultural management. Um, certainly those are important, but when we get right down to the questions of carbon alone, which ultimately uh, these feedstocks have to stand on their carbon reduction potential above all else if they're going to be qualified feedstocks uh, for the clean power plan or any other kind of carbon accounting policy. I mean, that's, that's really the key here that we have to cut through, and that, that really depends on these issues of scale um, and, and the, the bounded nature of these accounting platforms. I hope that summarizes pretty well some of the, the questions that have been brought up by our audience and the points that have been offered by Peter. Um, if you have any last minute sort of large scale questions, time. But in the meantime, meantime Peter, I want to ask you if there's any final thoughts you want to leave us with. Um, is, is the, the summary I gave uh, suitable there, or do you want to add something that we should really take away from this um, for our next presentation? As you think about that, I will mention to our audience that in a couple of weeks, we're going to have a second presentation on this topic, where we'll be talking a little bit more specifically about the carbon accounting scheme that's been recommended by the EPA in the past and is likely to influence the state Im implementation plans that are being built right now that will incorporate biomass. So Peter, uh, any final thoughts you want to leave us with today? Uh, sure. Well, I just you know flipped back to this earlier slide. Um, and the, I think, you know, I tried to capture 
what I think some of the big issues are in, in these four categories. You know, in addition to these categories of the scope, you know, what do you count, what don't you count, and what's your baseline, I guess I can't emphasize the importance of those two enough. Um, you know, in addition to the spatial and temporal scales that we discussed, in greenhouse gas emissions among feedstocks and within a feedstock. So, so besides these four, you know, variability and then, uh, you know, variability among feedstocks and within feedstocks is real. So I think I tried to point out, I think we may get further by trying to identify the most promising opportunities with kind of the lowest risk of a perverse outcome you know that might that might be the as close as I'll get to a recommendation of you know how do we focus on getting the opportunities um, with, without having results that we don't want. You know, just the last point where we are focusing on bioenergy production. Uh, if we're interested in reducing greenhouse gas emissions, we also should be thinking about uh, reducing on the demand side. Um, and if we're thinking about large policies, um, you know, are there interactions be between those things at the policy scale? That's well beyond <laughs> anything we talked about, but it's something to consider. Great. Thank you so much, Peter. Um, I, it was a lot to go through today. It's generated a lot of questions. You know, <laughs> of course, we can't set out to, to resolve this extremely complicated uh, topic in, in a one hour, or I guess an hour and 20 minutes. We have done a, a great job in initiating that conversation and, and getting that going. If you want to continue to, to interact with us, um, Peter's uh, contact information was posted in the chat pod, and it will accompany the recording of this, uh, of this presentation that will be posted through um, our Clean Power Plan website. Um, I'll, that's available through YouTube and should be up tomorrow sometime for easy sharing. You can also contact me. I will include my contact information in there as well. And feel free to share word about this series uh, with your associates in the future. Thank you all so much.